students so we have reached the ninth lecture for the module of research methodology now in all the previous modules we had learned about how to collect data how to conduct a good research the various concepts of research designs and so on for in this module we will be learning about some intricate aspects of conducting a research data analysis to do so we need to understand two important concepts that of measurements and scaling so this methodology will enable you to understand the concept of measurement and attitude scaling in a good research this will familiarize you with the different research methods and techniques while measuring and attitude scaling your data when you try upon different research designs and this will also assist you in the qualitative and quantitative methods of measurement and attitude scaling techniques so with this in today's class we would be dealing basically about all the concepts related to measurement the various levels of measurement the scales of measurement the criteria for a good measurement the comparison of the scaling techniques the attitude and the different scales which goes for attitude measurement now E.L. Thorndike was a great social researcher. He was a sociologist as well as a psychologist primarily who said that if a thing exists, it exists in some amount. And if it exists in some amount, it can be measured. Anything which exists will have either a quantitative or a qualitative value attached to them now if a thing is existing or if a thing comes into being be it any matter it can be quantified either physically through the physical means of measurement or it can be gauged through the qualitative means of measurement now if a thing exists it exists in some amount and if it exists in some amount the very word some amount implies a quantification so if there is a quantification then things can be measured so what is basically measurement measurement is nothing but the ways in which you assign numbers or symbols to denote certain characteristic of an object in a pre-specified manner so you have a preset condition of the rules through which you will gauge assess quantify a thing so measurement is nothing but the means by which you assign a number for example one hand if it implies one mass of 500 grams another hand would imply double the quantity which might imply 1000 grams so you are associating certain attributes or properties with certain quantities so you are using the quantity and you are also denoting it with a particular symbol so measurement means assigning numbers or other symbols of objects to a pre specified parameter it can be one to one correspondence between the numbers and the characteristics being measured the rules for assigning the number should be standardized and applied uniformly rules must not change over objects or time so have you ever observed a 
sometimes when you buy certain things it is written that it does not stand in accordance with the standard rules of measurement so what it implies that if 100 grams implies a certain amount of matter that same amount of matter if it does not meet that prescribed standard then the product is sold with a disclaimer that it does not conform with the standard measurement proportion so the rules must not change if the rules keep on changing there will be a confusion and the accuracy of the result will get hampered so firstly you should be sure that any mass or emotion that is quantified will have a symbol attached to it and that symbol will characterize certain preset parameters these parameters are set by observing certain guidelines and frameworks which are constant and rarely do change with time and it can be a one-on-one -on -one basis where numbers and characteristics being measured will be governed by will be governed by stringent frameworks where the frameworks aren't altered easily now what is measurement in research in research measurement applies that you are measuring your variable and to measure your variable forms an indispensable part of your research project study for example if we take two potted plants samplings and we plant those samplings and we observe the independent variable we observe the dependent variable and we see that certain changes in the independent variable can cause massive changes in the dependent variable so the alteration is noted now on what parameters are you noting the alteration should be measured so this is what we exactly do in research when it comes to measurement the research problem will indicate to us what is to be measured how accurately it is to be measured and how reliably we are going to measure it so in any research study it is very important that along with the hypothesis that you set to prove via your observation or your experimentation method you need to see how are you going to control it how are you going to monitor it what amount of variable changes would result in what effect in the overall experimental structure now some things or concepts which are inherently abstract in nature for example job satisfaction employee morale brand loyalty of customers are more difficult to measure than concepts which can be assigned with numerical values so the gist of this is any day quantitative things can be measured easily because they stand to an assigned number than qualitative things which are more abstract in nature now we use a term called operation in measurement now don't worry operation is not a surgical strike which you would conduct but it does require a certain sense of preciseness so in order for a concept to have the quality of being measurable it must first be operational now by operational management we would imply an operation may be conceptualized as a definition that gives meaning to concept by specifying the activities or operations which are necessary in order to measure it so whatever you will be measuring should be first made operational 
For example, a satisfied customer will make at least five purchases of product A from shop D over a three month period of time. So, in order to measure that, you must make sure that the store is operational in nature so that you can go and visit the shop over a prolonged period of time, do your necessary purchases, make the necessary difference in the revenues which the people are looking for and then we can make our own hypothesis and judgment whether the product is successful or not. So basically operation implies that you have to have the quality of operation in order to be able to be measured. Now, what are the scales in measurement? Now, scale is what? A scale is basically a continuous spectrum or a series of categories and has been defined as any series of items that are arranged progressively according to the value or magnitude in which an item can be placed according to its quantification. So, scale is nothing but it is defined as a series of items. You have, for example, uh, five uh, measuring scales and in that series of items, they are all progressively arranged from say number one to number five. Now that would imply each progressive component of the scale would imply a certain value or magnitude into which the items can be placed for its quantification. So for instance, if we consider an attitude scale from one to five, each respondent is given a number that is one can be extremely unfavorable and number five can be extremely favorable. So between two extremes, there are sub extremes and from there you need to do your rating. So the measurement is the actual assignment of a number from one to five to each respondent. So when the survey is created, in this process, we will see that the rating which the product receives will be accounted as the measurement of the product for each response. In other words, when we say scales in measurements, it simply implies that to each progressive item, we have a value or magnitude attached to it and based on the rating which we give to the value or magnitude, the measurement of the desired product is done. Now what are the types of measurement scales? Now measurement scales are divided into basically four types. That is the nominal scale, the ordinal scale, the interval scale, and the ratio scale. So nominal scale would imply the lowest level of measurement, whereas the ratio scale would imply the highest level of measurement. Now, what is a nominal or classificatory scale? Now, each subgroup has a characteristic property which is common to all the subgroups. For example, tree, house, taxi, gender can be male or female. So, the tree can be male or female, the, uh, the taxi driver can be male or female. So, each subgroup has a characteristic property which is common with all the subgroups. The ordinal or ranking scale would imply that it has the characteristics of nominal scale. Nominal scale is where the classification is taking place within the subgroups. Now, ordinal or ranking scale will give you 
the characteristics of the nominal scale. For example, income can be above average, below average, and so on. Then you have the interval scale. Now, interval scale has all the characteristics of an ordinal scale. For example, the temperature will be given to you. Now, in the interval scale, you will appropriately measure the changes in temperature with the scales provided within the thermometer. Then ratio is the property of an interval scale. For example, height or income and so on. Now, what exactly is a nominal scale? It is the lowest of the four levels of measurement. Now, the categories that are not more or less but different from one another in the same way falls in the nominal scale group. So, they are mutually exclusive and exhaustive in nature. Basically, they are the name categories where the numbers would only serve as labels or tags for identifying or classifying the object. Now, when you are using a nominal scale for identification, you have to see that there is a strict adherence to the one-on-one -on -one correspondence between the numbers and the objects. Now, the numbers here would not reflect the amount of the characteristics present by the object, but they would imply only the permissible amount which can be reflected in a nominal scale. Now, only limited statistics which are based on the classification would be used in the nominal scale. Now, we come to the next scale, which is called the ordinal scale. Now, what is an ordinal scale? Now, ordinal scale is a ranking scale in which the numbers are assigned to objects to indicate the relative extent to which the object will pass on certain characteristics. So basically what happens in ordinal scale is you have the object and then you can determine whether the object has less or more or less the same characteristic that the object had with the other object but why it is not more now or why it is not less now. Then any series of numbers can be assigned to an ordinal scale and it preserves the ordered relationship between the objects. Now, in addition to the counting operation allowable for a nominal scale data, ordinal scales also permit the use of statistics like your quartile deviation, the percentile, the median, and so on. Now, what is an interval scale? Now, interval scale is the numerically equal distances on the scale which represent equal values in the characteristics being measured. So if you are plotting say 5, 10, 15, 20, there will be an interval of 5 in the plotting. So it permits comparison of the difference between objects the location of the zero point is not fixed, but the zero point and the units of measurement are arbitrary. Now, we use statistical techniques into it, and these statistical techniques may include all of those that can be applied to the nominal or ordinal data. And in addition to your arithmetic mean, standard deviation, and other commonly known measures of statistical analysis, which you probably use in market research to find how a product is doing in the market. Now, interval scales also allow comparison for differences of magnitude. Example, if you have to measure attitude, but it will not allow you to determine the actual strength of the magnitude. The next we have the ratio scale. Now, 
ratio scale possesses all the properties of your nominal scale, ordinal scale, and interval scale. And it has an absolute zero point from where you begin. Now, it is meaningful to compute ratios of scale basis. All statistical techniques can be applied to the ratio, the data. So, in what ratio are you distributing it is seen through the ratio scale and it has a zero absolute so zero is considered the whole number here now what happens is for a student uh, capacity of 200 students we have um, say 50 teachers in the uh, this thing in the institute now for 50, what will happen is we will see that 50, 200 divided by 50 would be 1 and 4. So 4 is to 1. So for every 4 students, you have 1 teacher. So 4 is to 1 will be your ratio. Oh, and that would be measured in the ratio scale. Now, let us go into details on how we use the nominal, interval, ordinal and ratio level. Now, nominal scale, basically in the previous slides as we have discussed, is classified into categories. So, any data you classify into categories and they cannot be arranged in an, any particular color is the nominal level for example eye color blue color blue colored eyes black colored eyes gray colored eyes brown colored eyes so what you're doing you are basically classifying it into categories blue brown black gray and they cannot be arranged in any particular order like we cannot give them that Blue eye is the first position holder and gray eye is the second position holder. That doesn't happen. In nominal level, we just arrange it. Like gender, religious affiliations like Hindu, Muslim, Sikhs and Christians. So in the nominal level, we cannot put... Uh, Hindu is the best religion, so Hinduism should come first. Christianity is the best religion, so it should come first. That does not happen. You are just categorically naming the subgroups. Then you have the ordinal level. Now, it involves data arranged in some order, but the difference between data values cannot be determined or meaningless. Now, ordinal value is basically used, for example, in the polar testing companies. Now, in the ordinal level, what is happening is, for example, I give you uh, four kinds of soft drinks, say thumbs up, Pepsi, Sprite and Coca-Cola. So, for probably one participant, thumbs up would be the first choice. For the other person, Coca-Cola might be the first choice. For the other, Sprite might be one. And for some other, say, an orange drink or anything else could be the, uh, uh, the least desired. So you are not uh, giving in to them a demarcation, but you are just creating a difference. And that difference is usually meaningless. What might be nice to you might not be nice to me. So, in ordinal level, we basically arrange it in some random orders and then the difference between the data are measured. However, they do not hold a significantly higher value. Then we have the interval level. Now, similar to the ordinal level but you have an additional property that meaningful amounts of difference between data values can be determined 
now there is no natural point there so in the interval level of data selection what we do is we put the measurement scale in an order where the different data to be determined have differences in the properties but there is no natural zero point for example if you measure the temperature on the fahrenheit scale now there is no absolute zero point here but with a meaningful amount of differences in the mercury level you can find the alteration in the temperature then we have the ratio level now in the ratio level the interval level with an inherent zero starting point is seen remember zero is the absolute in the interval level now differences and ratios are meaningful for this kind of measurement so the difference like 200 students in a college how many teachers allotted out of a total staff strength of 50 4 is to 1 that is why every 4 students we have one teacher the monthly income of surgeons or distance traveled by manufacturers representative per month the monthly income of surgeons would be divided into the income they get from the private hospital and income to the government hospital so if they are working say 80 hours a week in a government hospital you would see the amount which they get at, and that would be the ratio compared to the amount of say uh, 20 hours they give to the private clinic so that is how you measure the differences in data to denote the differences in data with an absolute zero level we use the ratio level next concept is that of an index management now what is an index measurement we always say go measure the index check the index man measurement now if a concept is simple it can be measured easily with one question or observation for example to what extent do consumers of product x like the product packaging material so you launch a um, product into the market and if you have to see in the index measurement firstly we can do it by simple measurement for example uh, to what extent do I like the color of this glass to the uh, the color of any other glasses I might be given so there are many colored glasses or there is a difference in the branding in which the glasses of water are being sent so product X can be anything so how do you like the packaging material of the glass you can like it very much you can like it somewhat you can like it you cannot like it at all so this is the index measurement now if however the concept to be measured is complex and accurate two or more questions or observations may be required in order to get an accurate data for example the level of a salesperson's motivation in a job depends on his job satisfaction the workplace environment or his family life now to measure that what we'll do we will monitor it in the form of say a survey sample we give it to a salesperson and then through the overall analysis conducted in the organization we would find that for some the job satisfaction would be the primal focus or motivation in their life for some the workplace environment might have an effect and while for some others the family life might prove as a boosting factor or a hindrance so indexes or composite measures are meant to deal with issues of multi-dimensionality for example 
an index of social class may be the variables of residence, occupation, and education. For example, if you are to measure which area in a particular locality is a posh area or is a, a slum area or is a middle class area, how will you do? You will set up certain parameters like the affordance of the residents, the occupation of the people residing in those residents, the education level of the people. Then you might come up to the conclusion that, okay, they are more educated, so they are able to draw a higher pay package. So that is how it goes on. Then you have various measures through which you are able to measure the output. Now, all of these would go into your index measurement. So, basically, index measurement is for a composite measure where you deal with the issues of multidimensionality and then from there onwards, you monitor it. Now, this is an example of a happiness index. Now, we have different kinds of index management. Now, the happiness index is a composite measurement of the factors which would go into measuring or relating to the happiness quotient. How happy are you? Recently, we've come across Bhutan to be the happiest country in the world with the highest happiness quotient. Now, what factors would go into the happiness quotient would be sub clause to get the index. Now, for example, if you have to monitor the role of schools to prove happiness index of students, so these are the cofactors. The core factors could be value-based teaching. Apart from having moral science lessons, the teaching should be such that ethical values are instilled on the child from an early age. So a good cordial environment in school is necessary for that, along with the concern for each other. So there should be a competition, often we hear the term, competition should be there, but there should be a healthy competition. So what is happening is basically we are measuring the data on factors or the extraneous variables that would directly cause an impact on the dependent and independent variables. That is, these extraneous Extraneous factors will aid on the children who are the dependent thing and happiness can always be an independent factor. So you need to have value-based teaching, you need to have a cordial environment in school, you need to have concern for each other. Empathy is something which is seen to be lacking in today's institution. So recently on a study that was conducted upon Japanese students, they found that the notion of empathy is instilled in the children from a very young age. So in this experiment, what they did was they carried a small baby who was barely, say, nine months old. So that baby is named Naomi and what happens in that setup is the child has the most important work to perform from the time period of 2 p.m. to 3 p.m. Now what does the child do? The child teaches empathy and how does an 8 month year old infant teaches empathy? The classes begin with the holding of hands and the children start singing. Hello baby Naomi, how are you doing today? So you are doing what? You are 
greeting the person. That is, you are concerned about the person. You are creating a cordial environment with the baby being in your presence. Then you organize co-curricular activities as per age group as well as local conditions. So this school has created the use of a child, a human child. That is the greatest psychological experimentation that can ever happen on empathy in any institute. So when the baby is there for that time period, the children have to create all sorts of activities, take part in these activities to keep baby Naomi happy. So what happens is they corner around baby Naomi, play with her, see the changes. Someday baby Naomi might not be well. So they see to it that baby Naomi is well rested and so on. So what is happening is you are creating a good behavior. The psychologist now notes the behavior in the students. So what is happening is some are asking, do you like the presence of the baby in the classroom? For some, the children say, yes, we do like the presence of the baby in the classroom, but the baby keeps on crying. Or some children say that I like to console the baby when she cries. So you are creating empathy, you are creating concern, you are engaging the children in the happiness activities. Now, by observing this behavior, by observing this feedback, we make the classroom teaching activity based on playful base. So, we teach the children about gender, the uh, possibilities that the child will eventually have when she grows up in a, say, gender stereotypical world. So you are creating awareness of the do's and don'ts. Then there will be a profile maintenance of each student and a better coordination between the school and parents. So what is happening is when children are being aware of each other, in that manner, they learn how to take care of others. So now, after the first phase of making the children aware of having a baby in the class, taking care of the baby, they are now introduced to the concept that each of the small details which you have taken care of for baby Naomi would now enable you to take care of each other for one you all were baby Naomi at some point of time. So it is doing what? It is drawing on from the values and teaching the children to draw from the empathetic level to a more relational level with the fellow babies. So it implies what? That the children should be kind to everyone, be respectful, and most importantly, lift each other whenever they need to. Now, because of these, there is a better coordination between the school and parents. Now, maintaining the profile of each student is done, and taking them out for visits to the real world, again, is pivotal because this interaction of the students with a real living human baby and then introducing them to the concepts of transformation where they all were babies once upon a time and now they are learning to grow up as a club group of civilized people goes on creating the happiness index. So similarly, other than happiness index, we have many other kinds of index. Like we have the body mass index where we see the proportion of say fat, protein and other vitamins that a body should have, should be composed of and then you measure the body mass index. Similarly, you see 
in restaurants we see uh, they have food and wastage index so they see how in marketing uh, research specifically they see how much amount of food is cooked in a particular day can serve how many people and what they can do to minimize the wastage so you see in some restaurants they have this concept of open fridge where after a point of time anyone can take it any amount of food that is kept outside the restaurant so what is it doing it is minimizing the uh, food wastage as and then from there we come to know that the proportion of the food materials used is directly proportional to the food materials consumed so we have all these variable factors which are composed into larger sub factors for a larger cost so this composite factors will lead you to the measurements of one larger cost so this is cost index management now what are the criteria of a good measurement now a good measurement will have three primal criteria that is validity then the second criteria will be reliability and the third criteria will be sensitivity now what is validity we often use the term you should conduct a good research and you should see if the test results are relevant or irrelevant valid or invalid now what is validity validity is the ability of a scale or measuring instrument to measure what it is intended to measure so whatever you are giving for measurement validity is the scale by which you measure what you intend to measure now for example absenteeism from work a valid measure of job satisfaction or are there any other influences like a flu epidemic which is keeping employees away from work so now you seeing the valid causes you're measuring that is the outbreak of flu a valid reason for absenteeism from work and if that is contributing to your job satisfaction or not now validity is again classified into two types the external validity and the internal validity the external validity of research findings is the data ability to be generalized across persons settings times and so on the internal validity is the ability of a research instrument to measure what it is purported to measure for example does the instrument really measure what it claims to measure so this will be the measurement of your validity the next is reliability now how will you see if a thing is reliable or not now reliability is a degree to which the measurements are devoid of any error and therefore in the position to yield consistent results also over repeated attempts over time for example for ordinal measures they always yield the same result then interval measurements always yield the same order and same distance between the measured items so the degree to which even after processes of repetition you will get a same result that is the degree of reliability so in the degree of reliability we see if you are capable of getting your data to commit zero errors so that you get the highest yielding result now this is a primal example of reliability after repeated use how capable is your stigmanometer able to give you a good result 
error free result so this is a man who is saying that i can't believe that my blood pressure is 170 over 110 it is beyond the permissible limits so the doctor is saying maybe it's because of poor reliability of measurement let me wait for a few minutes and check it again so probably because of over usage it's showing an error so what will happen is it will show differences in your total overall blood pressure now when you let the mercury level of the sigmanometer rest then probably you might be assured that it might give you an accurate result so you try it again and again until you get the accurate result which is guided by your already preset parameters and unless you don't you check it and then you draw the conclusion whether the instrument is reliable enough to check the pressure level or not now the third criteria for a good measurement is the ability of sensitivity now sensitivity is the ability of a measurement or instrument to accurately measure variability in stimuli or responses for example on a scale the choices very strongly agree strongly agree don't agree offer more choices than a scale with two choices agree and don't agree and is thus more sensitive so sensitivity would intensify the degree by which you are trying to measure a certain data for example if i levy a survey on you that gst should be implemented at 5% for her, uh, domestic items or gst should be implemented at 18% for domestic items so in that thing we first see the negative value if gst is implied at 18% that would mean a raised expenditure so we see we give, if we give two options agree or disagree it will not intensify the need to reduce the gst to five percent from 18 percent but if you have a rating scale a measurement scale which will intensify the process and say that on a scale of uh, very strongly agree strongly agree don't agree uh, how would you rate the implementation of GST from 18% to 5% so for some you might very strongly agree for some people they might simply agree and for some they don't agree at all so that GST should altogether be taken off now based on the factors very strongly agree and strongly agree the researcher is quickly able to understand the imminence of the result so the response if you find say 1 million people saying very strongly agree and you have like 30 lakh people saying strongly agree you will know the immediate action you need to take based on the response you have received now this is another example of sensitivity now sensitivity of microorganisms to antibiotics for example if i have launched a drug say diclofenac now in sensitivity what we do is sensitivity is measurement of the antibiotic sensitivity of an organism in the laboratory and it is designed to predict whether an infection will respond to treatment with that antibiotic or not for example 
this particular strain of drug called diclofenac is known to reduce your physical pain now usually diclofenac is prescribed by sports doctor now when you see consumer representatives or the sales person going on and trying to sell a diclofenac he will usually sell a diclofenac to person saying who has received a injury on field but while playing sports and so on now this diclofenac will not guarantee the need that apart from healing bone related ailments this diclofenac will also deal with the healing of uh, say other allied diseases so for example if you have an eye sty or a boil in your eye now that is caused by the bacteria and the dirt which works upon your eyelid now you need to see whether this diclofenac strain will be able to reduce your pain and stop further infections now we know diclofenac is only meant for reducing pain now the eye sty will be constant in your eyelid but your pain is subsided but the infection is not gone now in sensitivity how we will we'll see we'll see if we can introduce any germ stain gram stain to reduce the effect of bacteria so what we do we introduce uh component say seracio peptidase now seracio peptidase is diclofenac plus peptidase now these two will go on to curb not only your bacterial infection but it will also reduce the pain so now if you having an eye sty a diclofenac will not give you much relief what you need is specialized drug relief that is seracio peptidase plus diclofenac relief so in sensitivity you check the factors which will make the difference merely giving stuff merely approving a certain data will not give you the desired result in sensitivity you take care of the integrities to get the desired result so for any plain injury you might prescribe a diclofenac but for structured injuries you might give a combination of seracio peptidase and diclofenac so what is happening is you are understanding the intensity of the problem and <coughs> excuse me you are giving localized medicine <coughs> the next is classification of the scaling techniques now when we classify the scaling techniques basically the scaling techniques are of two types the comparative scale and the non comparative scale now what is the comparative scaling technique in comparative scaling technique we again have a subdivision of techniques that is pair comparison rank order comparison constant sum Q-sort and other procedures, and non-comparative scales would be continuous rating scales and itemized rating scales. Now, itemized rating scales would again be divided into Likert scale, semantic differential scale, and staple scale. <coughs> Now, we'll go into all of these techniques in detail. Now, what is a comparative and a non comparative scale now a comparative scale is where it involves the direct comparison of a stimulus comparative itself is a compound word of comparing you are directly comparing two stimulus objects so comparative scale data must be interpreted in relative terms and they have 
only ordinal or rank order properties. Now, in non-comparative scales, each object is scaled independently of the others in a stimulus set. So, the resulting data are generally assumed to be interval or ratio scale. Now, comparative scale would be again as divided, be divided into paired comparative, two-tailed comparative, paired comparison, constant sum comparison, QSOP comparison, and rank order comparison. Now, what is a paired comparative scaling? Now, a respondent is presented with two objects and asked to select one according to some criteria. Now, the data observed are ordinal in value. Now, paired scaling is the most widely used comparative scaling technique. For example, I am introducing a shampoo to you and I give you two similar brands of shampoo and based on certain attributes, I ask you how would you like to rate it. So, with N brand, N to the power N minus 1 by 2 pair comparisons are required. Now, under the assumption of transitivity, it is possible to compare comparison data to a rank data. Now, this is the method in which a comparative data analysis is done. Now, before we go into it, first thing you have to see that the positive sign implies better than and the negative sign implies worse than. Now, for each chart, add up the number of ones in each column to get the highest rank employee. So, these are my two divisions of comparison. Comparison for the trait of quality of work and comparison for the trait of creativity. Mind you, we are looking at job comparison. That is one large trait. And we have presented two related stimuli. Quality of work and creativity. Now, how would you read this chart? As compared to, you firstly do the uh, collection of the persons whom you want to compare. So, you have uh, person A as Art, B as Maria, C as Chuck, D as Diane, and E as Chelsea. So, now, among Art, Maria, Chuck, Diane, and Jose, we'll see which employee has the trait for quality of work and which employee has the trait for creativity. Now, <coughs> as compared to first candidate, we take a Art, uh, a, a minus means worse. If there is nothing, then it is not accounted. So, Maria has, Maria is worse than, uh, wait, Maria is better than Chuck and Art, but Maria is worse than Diane and Jose. Now, Maria as compared to the others, Maria is worse than Art and uh, Chuck, Diane, and Jose when it comes to the quality of work. Similarly, Chuck is worse than Art, right? Better than Maria has, is on the same level with himself and Yen is what? He is better than Yen and he is worse than Jose. Now, we are going to see Jose. So, each variable we are using is denoted by a null space. So, if you are using R, you will nullify him. Maria, nullify B. 
Chop nullify C. DM nullify D. D is chosen nullify him. Clear? Now we will again read the chart. Now what does chart say? Say chop shot in terms of quality of work. So C is denoted by chop. So chop is worse than art but better than Maria and better than the N and worse than Jose. Now let's do a compiled reading. The N is better than Art, Maria and Jose but worse than Chuck. Then Jose is better than uh, Art, Maria and Chuck but worse than the N. So who has the highest? Maria ranks the highest here. As compared to Maria, Chuck, Diane, and Jose, Art is worse than Maria and Chuck and Diane when it comes to creativity along with Jose. So then um, B is Maria. Maria is better than Art, worse than Chuck, but Again, he is better than Dian and Jose. Chuck is better than Art and Maria when it comes to creativity, but he is worse than Dian and but he is better than again Jose. Dian is again better than Art, Chuck, and he is worse than. Maria and Jose when it comes to creativity. Jose is better than art and the end in creativity, but he is worse than Maria and Chuck. So the positive negative is denoting to you in the chart how you would see a paired comparative method. So it implies that for each chart, when you add up the numbers of one in each column, you get the highest ranked employees. So here in this chart, uh, we see Art has two, Maria has uh, one, two, three, four. Chuck has two positives, two negatives, comes to zero. Then Diane has three positive, one negative, comes to two. Then uh, Jose has three positive, one negative comes to two. There's a tie. So Maria has the highest. Then in this chart, how will you deduce this? Art and Maria are there. So uh, one, two, three, four. So four negative, Art has the highest here when compared to Maria who has uh, three positive, one negative amounts to two. Chuck has three positive, one negative amounts to one. Dian has two positives and two negative if amounts to zero. And Jose has two positive and two negative amounts to absolute zero again. Now, the paired charts can be again double paired as well. Now, what is the difference? For example, if you are trying to find out in a particular experiment, how will you find out in paired comparison uh, a certain question? How would you frame it? So first you need to see if, it, if doing that experiment, something improves in that experiment. What's the difference or change if I do something? What is the effect of doing this? So in the double comparison, you'll see is this better than this? Does doing this give me better results? And does it matter if I don't do this? How will it affect me? Then the conditions here would be the same group before and after measuring the change difference improvement in variable. And over there, it would be two different groups comparing one variable across for in, uh, independent measures. And what are you manipulating? The in-between, the change in conditions. For example, 
the fact that you exercise, you drink caffeine, you watch a scary movie, you are manipulating it. The treatment, what each group gets done to them. For a control group, nothing is done. Now, exploratory data analysis would include the usage of link graph, dot plot of differences, and you derive your variable or increase your variable accordingly. In uh, exploratory data analysis, you do uh, a double comparative of dots in case of a double pair comparison, and you draw on the summary statistics and you explore it in terms of shape and distance. Now, what you don't do, when it comes to simple pair dependent comparison, you don't separate the two measurements and compare. You don't break the link. And again, it's the same that you compare the two groups that are not dependent. You don't do that. Uh, then when it comes to examples of pair comparison, heart rate before compared to after exercise, how much do heart rates increase? Now, this is just a pair comparison. Two simple similars are there. When you say run at a speed of 5 km per hour, what is your heart rate as compared to if you uh, are doing a double pair comparison? If you say that, okay, 5 km per hour, your heart reaches in 20 minutes up to say a beat of 1. 35 to 150 depending on your body mass index now you will see that can people who stretch perform an exercise longer than people who don't obviously if you're stretching if you are used to warming up techniques and everything there will be a considerable difference in your total heart rate how your hand uh, heart handles the uh, TMT test or the stress test so all of these are measured and you get a final note of the changes in your heartbeat if you have normal heartbeats or if you have an irregular heartbeat or arrhythmia and so on. Now we have the non-comparative scale. Now the continuous rating scale is there. Now in non-comparative scales, it's divided into the continuous rating scale, then Likert scale, the itemized rating scales are again divided into Likert scale, semantic differential scale, and staple scale. Now, in continuous rating scale, you place a mark on a continuous line. For example, reaction to TV commercials. So, uh, you place a continuous line on the mark. So how would you react to TV commercials? Some people find TV commercials as distracting. So we, we put them out. Do you find it distracting? Strongly agree, very strongly agree, somewhat agree, do not agree, and all. So that is just one straight line in which you are measuring. So it is easy to construct. And uh, scoring can be cumbersome unless computerized. This classification, easy, uh, somewhat easy, strongly agree, uh, strongly disagree, and all is cumbersome. So uh, in continuous rating scale, it's a continuous approach without any break. Now, itemized rating scales like the Likert scale have degrees of agreement. Either you strongly agree and number five, you still strongly agree or you choose to disagree. So there's a rating of one to five. For example, measurement of attitude. Do you like your workplace environment? So it's very easy to conduct, administer and understand the changes. But it is also again very time consuming. Then you have semantic differential processes. Now this has been a larger scale where you have a seven point scale with bipolar labels also you need brand product and company images so company image is say hindustan unilever product is say a toothpaste now 
Unilever does it manufacture Colgate or close off it's up to you so you see the versatility and the controversy as to whether the data are interval for example instant noodles maggi produces it sunfeast also produces it the product is the same company images are different and the brand maggi is more popular than your brand sunfeast but again the controversy declines to say that maggi is unsafe for consumption so you are measuring the semantic differential or the changes in the frequency that is happening with the consistent changes then you have stable skill now it is unipolar in nature it's a 10 point scale between minus 5 to positive 5 without a neutral point of 0 So instead of zero, you will have the point of assessment and minus five four three two one plus five four three two one. The measurement of attitude and images it's easy to conduct and administer, and but the drawback of this method is it is very confusing and difficult to apply. That is, what would minus five imply then plus five? or what intensity will minus 4 and minus 5 differ now we come to the concept of rank order scaling now rank order scaling now respondents are presented with several objects simultaneously and asked to order or rank them according to their criteria It is possible that the respondent may dislike the brand rank one in an absolute sense. Furthermore, rank order scaling also results in ordinal data. Only n minus one scaling decisions should be made in rank order scaling. You cannot go to n n minus one uh, into n divided by two. No, only n minus one should be seen. So that is, you present a particular. product and you ask why are you not liking the product and on what grounds are you not liking it the difference so you are representing the object with several similar and simultaneously asking the uh guinea pig of yours to respond to the changes in the variable so you have this difference between the rank and pairing scale examples so for ors ranking scale is please rank the books listed below in the order of your preference jot the number 1 next to the most you prefer number 2 by your second choice and so forth so this might all together be not your choice of books at all you might find harry potter lord of the rings twilight lion witch and wardrobe too uh say childish for your taste or it's way too oh much filled with fantasy but you are forced to take a ranking scale so among harry potter lord of the rings twilight lion witch and the wardrobe you may place it as sometimes these kind of surveys are very intentionally placed for the survey person might intentionally want you to put harry potter in number 1 2 3 for it is a suggestive measure and a forced measure because you are not having the flexibility to name four books according to your liking according to your choice you have to answer it only in a structured process then you have the pair comparison scaling for each pair of study skills listed below please put a mark by the one you prefer most if you have to choose between two as comparison scale similar similar for one whole course right so when you study either you have to choose whether you like note taking or memorizing personally i don't like either of the two but again it's a forced choice then memorizing or a graphic organizer i would prefer a graphic organizer now note taking and graphic organizer personally i would still prefer a graphic organizer for in this chart the graphic organizer would mean but for some note taking is a process by which when they go on taking the notes it is in that process that they continue to register it so then there are some people who have highly photographic memory they can remember anything at any given point of time 
and note taking is ineffective for them because they cannot write after a certain point of time so memorizing is their preferred mode of study so this is the pair comparison scale here i am giving you select the uh, options but still i am giving you flexibility here i am not giving you flexibility at all i am giving you the choice of books which i want you to give and based on that you have to make your choices now the next is constant sum calling now what is a constant sum calling now respondents allocate a constant sum of units such as 100 points to attributes of a product to reflect their importance so a scale unit would be 1 to 5 a variable unit now in 1 to 5 every point would denote say 20 values so point 1 would imply 20 2 40 3 60 480 and 5 would be 100 so the 100 would be your sum totality of all the points now if an attribute is unimportant you put zero if an attribute is twice as important as some other attribute you put two so it's equip amounting to 40 points now the sum of all these points is what you get that is 100 for example if i ask you to buy a car now buying a car would indicate the relative importance you give to a particular aspect of the car so your car is there i let you uh, choose between two products now say i let you choose between a sedan and an suv so all those factors will be denoted for a sub total of 100 points so if we take an suv like say terreno so style if you like it if it, you're giving 5 points it implies that you've given the 5 uh, that is it amounts to a uh, a uh, sub range between a uh, 3 because it's between 40 to 60 then right you might give it a 10 which will come in the negative so then economical how economical you find you would give it a point of state uh three uh two because it will come under the median of 30 warranty again you might give it a zero because it does not matter so friendly dealer doesn't matter it comes up to 100 now we take the other sample of the car say we take a honda city again style wise i give 50 ride wise i give a 10 economically wise i give 35 warranty wise five friendly dealership it's coming to 100 now individually if i have to see style wise say honda city gets 50 while say terreno gets say 25 or 30 so then i can draw the differences out of the indices right wise i can do the comparison so pair comparison can be done from this study also but in totality what you are seeing is what is the total number of points which the car is getting and based on that you are placing your desirability so for example if terreno is getting uh, a complete 100 point and uh, the points of honda city if it comes to 98 then probably terreno is your desired choice or honda city if the results are reverse it might be your preferred choice so basically in this method we give a sum total of 100 units and out of this 100 units we allow the respondent to uh um uh, quantify them based on the attributes which they find suitable and based on that we quantify and measure the number and then we engage in a compared study and then we draw on the conclusion now 
case study method of constant sum scaling. For example, we have launched a say a lux soap in the market. Now, if certain attributes of bathing soaps are given like mildness, how mild is lux on your skin? Does it uh, pr provide leather? Does it provide fragrance? A good fragrance or a bad fragrance? What is the cost? Is it cost effective or not? Then please allocate 100 points. So, what is happening here is we are allocating the product lux and for in the first half we are seeing a sum constant uh, analysis so based on mildness if lux is getting 40 leather wise if lux is getting uh, say 20 then fragrance wise if it's getting 10 cost wise if it's getting uh, 30 it's coming up to sum total of 100 now in that sum total of 100 you can see the factors where the lux as a brand is more popular than say dove now these dove again based on mildness if we give dove uh say 50 on mildness leather we give um say uh 20 then fragrance wise we give 20 cost wise we give 10 probably lux is more expensive than uh uh dove or dove is more expensive than lux so we see how we allocate but the sum total is 100 now we are seeing the total cost and from then on we carry our uh, study where we carry a tailed analysis and see which product is more popular or not. Then the more import points an attributor receives, the more important that attribute is. Now if you see that mildness is something which has cost you know more points than compared to leather and fragrance. If we see cost has got the most important point higher point than mildness we know that cost is an important factor while gauging the product so the more points each of these attributes receive will imply how important that attribute is so based on that we know that the product should be cost effective the product should have mildness then the extraneous factors like leather and fragrance can take place now if an attribute is not important at all you put it zero for example well, if uh, moisture is not important at all put zero so if attribute is twice important but you need fragrance so you put some more twice the point so you know that out of the chart with the allocation cost is important Mildness is important, fragrance is important, and then leather is important. So this is how we do the total constant sum scaling of any product which is launched in the market. The next is attitude measurement. Now, look at this Calvin and Hobbes um, cartoon where it's saying that attitude is contagious so is your attitude worth catching so here we are doing an analytical study on how important our attitude is so what is an attitude attitude may be defined as an enduring disposition to constantly respond in a given manner to various aspects so if I give you a stimulus, every stimulus will have his or her response. So in attitude, what we do is we see the physical quality. No, we don't see that. We see more of the psychological aspect in attitude measurement. Now that could be the positive uh, effect you have the positive response you have towards the stimulus or the negative response which you have towards the stimulus so attitude may be defined as an enduring disposition your disposition could be 
a positive disposition or negative disposition and the need to constantly consistently it can be a prolonged negative disposition or it can be a prolonged positive disposition and by which manner we measure your overall compatibility in the society so basically attitude has its abc's so what comprises attitude effect behavior and cognition now effect or evaluative uh, component is the first component of attitude so it comprises of your feelings or emotions that something might evoke for example if i show you a red rose if it evokes a positive uh, acts as a positive uh, stimulus you might give a positive um, attitude or if it evokes a negative nasty feeling towards the rose you might show me a negative disposition then behavior the tendency or disposition to act in certain ways towards something the rose might make you happy so you have what a positive disposition towards rose the rose might make you sad it might make you cry you have a negative disposition towards rose the cognition why have you started crying seeing a rose or why are you feeling happy seeing rose so that is dealt by your cognitive aspect or your brain the brain will let you know of the thoughts and beliefs and ideas that you associate with the rose so getting a rose might invoke feelings where you are loved and cared for and so it denotes a happy feeling to you getting a rose might denote something sad like your breakup or a loss of a dear one so you tend to stay away from it so attitude has mainly three components abc affect behavior and cognition so in detail if we have to conceptually define the components uh we have the effective or evaluative component where you are reflective of the person's general feelings or emotions towards an object or subject that is whether you like dislike love hate something for example some people love holy i personally hate holy i dislike holy for weird reasons so my effective nature towards the festival of holy is negative i hate holy so it's something like that now cognitive component it reflects a person's awareness of and knowledge about an object or subject i know what holy stands for i know why it is celebrated i have read in books i have seen it practically but what do i hate i hate getting dirty i do not like the colors those colors probably make me feel dirty they don't go away probably i have a trauma related to the color is over there so that is why probably i hate it so it is in my brain why i hate holy i might hate the colors when it comes to the holy dyes but probably i might like dressing in vibrant colors so how my brain is cognizing the difference is very important the behavioral component it is reflective of a person's intentions and behavioral expectations and predisposition to action so if during the festival of holy if someone comes and gives the colors probably i might just start crying or i might break down because i don't like to associate myself with the festival so what is happening here i am going through a emotional outbreak why probably because i lost someone during that so it's a trauma my brain is undergoing but if someone gives me a lovely color dress or someone gives me a nice colored lipstick or someone gives me a nice colored book i might be happy because i associate that with my happy thoughts so the attitude by which i present myself will then again form the perceptions which you will form so abc's are very important components of attitude now this is an illustration of the 
components of attitude attitude again now if i have to measure the job evaluation first i'll go to the effective or evaluative value it would be i like or i dislike my job now why do i like or dislike will be taken care of by the cognitive aspect my work is challenging and interesting then the behavioral aspect will be i am reliable and i work very hard for my job so if i'm not getting the necessary remuneration then probably i don't like my job if i'm getting the desired remuneration i like my job so this is how you measure the attitude now good attitude will again go on to give you a good work culture and this is how the job evaluation would be done now this attitude would comprise an important test in organizational behavior now measurement of attitude it can be very difficult to measure an attitude so indicators such as verbal expression physiological measurement techniques and overt behavior are used for this purpose so if i tell you that okay i am aware of the fact that you hate mathematics now i am giving you to solve a statistical problem so you just see whether you can do it you first say i can't do anything related to math now you go and see i wish i knew math or i wish i could utter the theorems and corollaries as a math professor would do then i think i can give it a shot then again you say i might as well do sub uh, sub part of math which i thought was tough i'm liking it okay i will do it now let me do it and then oh yeah i did it and i got it so for example if you give me math the first thing i'll say is oh i don't know trigonometry and algebra i wish i could do trigonometry and algebra i think i can do trigonometry and algebra with a little amount of study then i might be able to do trigonometry and algebra okay leave it i'll do it then oh wow i can do it because i am able to understand the concepts now and look i did it so this will measure my attitude and what would be my from my attitude from a fear driven attitude i am going on building a healthy and positive attitude and giving things a chance so these cannot be simply measured like 1 kilo of motivation 20 kilos of determination 30 kilos of will power no what you do you measure these by certain indicator on scales and this can be your verbal expression your physiological measurement techniques and overt behavior now how will you rate the techniques to measure attitude so rating scales are frequently employed in business research for measuring attitude now some of the most popular rating scales are simple attitude scales category scales the likert scale semantic differential scales the numerical scales the constant sum scale staple scale and graphic scale now what is a simple scale in simple attitude scale you simply agree or disagree that is in attitude scaling individuals are typically asked whether they agree to a subject or whether they disagree and then they are asked to respond to the question so simple attitude scales have the properties of a nominal scale and they can be used in instances where the respondent's education level is low and the questionnaires are lengthy so you just need to reply yes or no you don't need to analyze it as rocket science then category scale consists of several response categories to provide the respondents with alternative ratings so category scales are more sensitive than rating scales so you have to answer categories whether you like rote learning or whether you like uh graphic cues so because of the large number of choices you get more information data and hence more insight then we have the likert scale now a likert scale 
is a measure of aptitude designed to allow the respondents to indicate how strongly they choose to agree or how strongly they choose to disagree with carefully constructed statements that range from a very positive to a very negative outlook. So, Likert scale may include number of questions including some of the respondents' attitudes and this thing can be collected easily from the index. Now, this is the Likert scale. Now, in this Likert scale, I have to say uh, or assess how would you determine your pain threshold. So, this is an assessment tool intended to help patient care providers assess pain according to individual patient needs. So, scale of 0 to 10 is provided to the patient for the patient's self-assessment. Now, the phases are given to interpret the pain expressed when the patient cannot communicate his or her pain intensity. So, the verbal description is if you are smiling, then the facial uh, scale would be a smiley. So, you have no pain. Then you have mild pain, that is you feel some pain or discomfort, but you can still complete most of your activities. So it will be a mid-range smiley. Then you have moderate pain. The pain makes it difficult to concentrate and occasionally at intervals, it will also interfere with your normal ability to conduct uh, certain activities. So such as reading, watching TV, or, uh, having a phone conversation. So moderately, you might say that, okay, my feet is hurting, I want to sit down, or my stomach is hurting, I feel like lying down, and so on. Then severe pain. That is, from moderate, now your pain is intensifying, that your pain is slowly rising. So you might ask people to just keep quiet and enable you with the process. Now, we have very severe pain that is the range between 7 to 9. The pain is quite intense and is causing you to avoid or limit physical activity. You cannot concentrate on anything except your pain. So, if I'm having a toothache, if I'm not having a toothache, I would give it zero mild pain. I will just let it go. A uh, little pain, I might take a painkiller, feel better, probably deliver the lecture. Then if I have severe pain, I'll be like, okay, I need to stop the class because I'm not able to concentrate. Then worse pain, chuck it, I'm not even talking to you. I will probably tear the questionnaire or I will just leave it and I'll start crying and I'll fall on the floor. Something. So you are indicating it to me via the thing. So... From normal green, we are using red, which is a more darker shade, to yellow, with red being the highest shade. So it's like a danger sign indirectly I'm trying to put through this show. So this is the light art scale where you are allowing respondents to see how strongly or how uh, can they intensify the degree to which they agree or they choose to disagree towards your created scale. Then we have a semantic differential scale. Now, the semantic differential scale is an attitude measuring technique which consists of a series of seven bipolar rating scales which allows response to a concept. For example, your organization, products, your service, your job satisfaction. The advantage of this method is it is versatile and on the other hand, it may use extreme measures which may influence the respondents. For example, uh, in the semantic differential scale, the attitude is measured by seven primal points. For example, this is the example of using a skill labor. Now, by this, 
I am trying to denote how useful the skill labor is for the uh, work which I intend to do. Now, uh, in skill labor, for example, if I perceive that usage of super skill labor is bad for my company because I might just incur losses in hiring them or usage of skill labor even if it is expensive is good for my company because I will get a better production value so what is happening here is to uh, to substantiate the degree by which I identify with it is being marked by the indicators which are there. Whether I strongly agree, mildly agree, simply agree, do not agree, completely disagree and all will be noted. The next is how worthless and valuable it makes me feel. If I use skill labor, it means I am worthless for the job I am assigned to be. Or if I use skill labor, I feel valuable because I am able to positively contribute to my organization by bringing in extra help to get a extended benefit. Unpleasant, probably the skill laborer is very haughty. He is very arrogant. He has a superiority complex. So it's unpleasant skill labor is very pleasant he's there to ease my discomfort the skill laborer will technically take care of all the discomforts i am facing right now so i do need the skill laborer boring i find the skill laborer boring because he's just hooked to the work he does not do anything other than the work probably the reason why he's more skilled than me but it still makes no sense to me. I find him interesting because of the kind of focus and dedication he's putting to that amount of work. And it's a learning experience for me because if I can, I could employ it for better use. Using the skilled laborer is unfavorable for my organization because slowly I will become dependent on him and I won't be able to do my work without the skilled laborer. Or it might be highly favorable because what I'm doing is over here, I am using the skilled laborer to get the optimized benefit. And with that, probably I can give a better show. Harmful, it's harmful because I am becoming dependent on the laborer. And I'm just not doing any way. I waste my time idling, doing nothing. Beneficial because seeing his skill and expertise, I'm learning on new skills which he's imparting. And it has resulted in a double production. So he's doing his work and I'm doing his work. So after going through all of these analyses on a bipolar 7 scale, you measure say from one to five, the degree or intensity you want to establish on the usefulness. And from there, we uh, draw our analysis and conclusion. The next is the staple scale. Now, previously, as we had discussed, the staple scale has no zero absolute. So what happens is in the staple scale, the staple scale is a unipolar or single testing unit rating scale with 10 categories from usually numbers from minus 5 to 5 so without a neutral point so where you need to have a neutral point you are just having zero so this scale is usually presented vertically so in uh, a staple scale say you take the factors for example, high quality and poor service. So in the staple scale, what will you do is first you see uh, minus one, two, three, four and five. And then you have minus one, minus two, minus three, minus four and minus five. Then another side, you have another gradation scheme where plus one, plus two x, 
plus 3 plus 4 and 5 is shown then in the other aspect you are being shown minus 1 minus 2 minus 3 minus 4 and minus 5 now if today I am conducting a survey to see how say a supermarket say big bazaar stands to the test so if I have to say that big bazaar provides a high quality service so on a scale of positive 1 to 5 and on a scale of negative 1 to 5 I have to read about the quality of services that is provided in the staple scale now again uh, this is for the quality of goods sold now again if I have to rate on the basis of poor service again on the scale of positive 1 to 5 integers and negative minus 1 to 5 integers I will see how they stand now based on that if I get a I will set the limit say 1 will indicate a, a good service 2 will indicate a, a very good service 3 is recommended then 4 is uh, strongly recommended and 5th is very strongly recommended similarly for this it's bad service very bad service do not uh, approve it uh, uh, do not uh, somewhat approve it then do not approve it at all and uh, do not approve it then do not approve it strongly do not approve it at all so if I'm trying to say what quality of produce it is selling so on that scale I'll measure it again for poor service if I have to measure it say uh, one is good service two is very good service three is somewhat good service four is strongly agreed that the service is good and fifth is very strongly agreed that the service is good then here again if I have to say that no bad service very bad service the service is probably worse the service is very worse the service is the most worst service I have ever encountered so it will give you an idea and then the data obtained by using this table scale can be analyzed in the same way you would analyze the semantic differential data that is by the set of scales you will see the extremes and from there you will draw your conclusion then we have the graphic scale now graphic scale is usually used by uh, organizational psychologists to uh, measure performance appraisal so your HR of a company might be probably using the graphic scale so performance factor is important and performance rating is important in the graphic scale so in graphic scale basically what we do is first performance factor is we see the subgroups so the first subgroup could be quality of work, skill and completeness. So in the performance rating we will say for example we will take a person named Joe. Now we will see if Joe consistently performs unsatisfactorily, occasionally performs unsatisfactorily, consistently performs satisfactorily, uh, sometimes his performance is superior and his um, performance is consistently superior so basic based on one two three four five allotment we give him a point say we give him uh, over here say we say that Joe is sometimes superior so I give him a point there now quantity of work done in a day is consistently unsatisfactory occasionally unsatisfactory consistently satisfactory somewhat satisfactory consistently superior and all i give him another point then in order to know whether joe's 
knowledge of the job is satisfactory or not we have to know whether the individual is able to show in his job performance so we'll see if the duties performed by joe is poorly done or if he's poorly informed about his work duties or if joe is occasionally unsatisfactory the rest of the time he does it then joe can answer most questions about the job so he knows his job he understands all phases of the job so his performance is very good he has complete mastery over the phases of this job so you can blindly trust joe when it comes to having a knowledge about his uh work skills then we have dependability uh, thing so we need to see if dependability is a factor when it comes to training joe so we need to see if he requires constant supervision if he requires constant supervision then it is a minus factor then he requires occasional follow up that is normal we all do then joe can usually be counted on or joe requires little supervision or joe requires absolute minimum supervision if you interview too much joe will stop functioning the way he should function so all of these factors will lead you to the fact that joe if he you see the rating scale now these are very graphic it is not like strongly agree strongly disagree no the rating scales are more intensely made it is giving you a vivid graphical record on how joe's abilities are being tested so what we are basically doing here is we are using joe's appreciation uh, uh joe's complete statement and we are doing a performance appraisal of joe so based on the set parameters which we have already set we are directly rating joe on the set parameters with some manipulated intensity so this is the graphic scale the next is the behavioral intention scale a behavioral intention scale is a special type of rating scale designed to capture the likelihood that people will demonstrate some type of predictable behavior intent towards purchasing an object or service in a future time frame so behavioral intention scale is nothing but we measure your intention on how you would behave in a particular manner so this is basically used for marketing research where we see how certain factors would imply the recurrence of our activity for example if we uh like a particular service by a hair stylist very much so how many times i would go to that particular hairdresser will imply my uh intention and it will also through my behavior imply that i am liking the product very much so in behavioral intention scale we have the rating scale for example how do you like this particular hair stylist skills so in behavioral intention scale from 1 to 5 we grade him then are you going to come back to that hairdresser again 1 to 5 we rate him then are you intent on doing any more service from that particular hair stylist so again you rate it if you are coming back after giving the feedback it implies that the hair stylist is skilled enough to meet your needs so your behavior your intention the positive feedback or the negative feedback suppose you hate the hair stylist so much that you never coming back so your behavioral intention will determine the sellability of the product now 
behavioral intention scale is usually monitored to the following effects for example there is a particular product which i would love to use so basically the popularity is done through word of mouth the intention of research and the intention of return and the future purchase intent for example from word of mouth you have come to know that a particular variety of uh, say sketch pen is very good so you tell the positive things about the sketch pen to a person named x uh, to the product name x so uh, you say that the sketch pen is very good it does not blot does not stain it's easy to use it's non toxic you go brag on and on about the sketch pen then you recommend the sketch pen in x to someone looking for a board so you go and tell them about the benefits of using the sketch pen now this product will be used by the person and again he will go on and see whether the attribute that you have mentioned has been clearly used or not then you go and encourage your friend to go on with the product x so you take the packet of sketch pen x and you distribute it among your variables say x1 x2 x3 x4 x5 now these people uh, x1 to x5 is some thing which will let you know that if everyone is agreeing to it it is a good product and through your word of mouth it has spread that the sketch pen is of a really superior quality and you may use it now the intention to return suppose someone puts you in the brain that sketch pen using sketch pen is fast i have found out a magical crayon set where i simply need to tap on the colors and it gets completely done or if someone comes and tells you that uh, coloring on a particular sheet by sketch pen is an old method now you can directly upload it in your ipad and you just need to tap on the colors using a particular app now what is the probability that you will return to the 20 rupees sketch pen you might return to the 20 rupees sketch pen because probably buying that ipad might be expensive for you now again what is the probability that you are not coming back you see that you are finding it very handy now to use the sketch pen instead of of plunging it on the ipad or you might find it otherwise and way wise so you might think that yeah no one uses sketch pen now if i use the ipad i can just tap on the colors it is relaxing therapeutic it gets done in the jiffy i can print and preserve it both digitally and manually then what is the future purchase intent so whether you intend to buy again something or you do not intend to buy so this is the behavioral intention scale through which you measure or we measure your intention on whether you are going to buy a particular product or not so with this we come to the end of our lecture and in this lecture as we have seen we have learned today all the modes of measurement types of measurement the various factors which goes on making a good measurement the attitude the good attitude and so on so thank you for your time and we come to the end of the ninth lecture thank you